Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Eternal God, the refuge and help of all your children, we praise you for all you have given us, for all you have done for us, for all that you are to us. In our weakness, you are strength. In our darkness, you are light. In our sorrow, you are comfort and peace. We cannot number your blessings. We cannot declare your love. For all your blessings, we bless you. May we live as in your presence and love the things that you love and serve you in our daily lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The prayer was Amen. written, by the, by the way, by St. Boniface. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. Thank you, Father. Our speaker this evening is the president of Catholic Answers. Christopher Check holds a degree in English literature from Rice University. He served for seven years as a field artillery officer in the United States Marine Corps before serving for 19 years as the vice president of the Rockford Institute. In 2012, he joined Catholic Answers, first as director of development, and then was named president in 2015. His writings have appeared in numerous Catholic and secular outlets, and he has addressed audiences across the United States and in Europe. In their spare time, he and his family run a show kennel called Top Meadow Cavaliers, named for G.K. Chesterton's Beaconsfield Estate, where they show and breed Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, the famed companions of the Stuart Kings. We're delighted to host him again at the ICC this evening, our, our favorite historian and, and storyteller of the saints. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Check. Welcome, Chris. Good to have you back. Uh, Father, always a joy and an honor. The Holy Bishop waited in his tent, praying his office. At 82, his body had slowed, but he had no less of the zeal with which he began his evangelization of the Germans four decades prior. Since felling the Donar Oak, the sacred tree of the pagans, Winfred, also called Boniface, had brought the gospel from England to the barbarians of Bavaria and Thuringia. Supported, supported by the mayor of the palace, Charles Martel, who at the Battle of Tours had stopped the Muslim advance in 732, Boniface established four dioceses east of the Rhine. When not baptizing German pagans, he had preached the gospel throughout the kingdom of the Franks. Nearly two centuries before Boniface, St. Remigius had baptized Clovis, king of the Franks, and the eldest daughter of the church was born. Boniface took France into his care, and he made formal the special union between the chair of Peter and the Franks. When he, representing Pope Zachary, anointed the son of Charles Martel, Pepin the Short, as the first Carolingian king. Boniface, Boniface's support of Pepin was deliberate and it was dynasty changing. The power of the Merovingian kings had faded and it was the mayors of the palace who held the real authority in France. And by anointing Pepin, Boniface secured the Franks as the special protector of Holy Mother Church. So aided, he ventured back in his old age to Phrygia on the southern shore of the North Sea, baptizing and preaching the mercy of Jesus Christ. And so it happened on the 5th of June in the year of our Lord, 754, Boniface waited with his entourage of monks for an embassy from the Phrygians coming to receive confirmation. As the sun rose, Boniface stepped out from his tent. He saw not a band of neophytes, but a gang of bandits brandishing clubs and swords. His attendants rose to defend him, but Boniface enjoined them to set down their weapons, calling his clergy to his side and holding in his arms the holy relics with which he traveled. The bishop said, sons, cease your fighting. Lay down your arms. The hour to which we have long looked is near, 
The day of our release is at hand. Take comfort in the Lord and endure with gladness the suffering he has mercifully ordained. Put your trust in him and he will grant deliverance to your souls. Be of stout heart. Fear not them who kill the body, for they cannot slay the soul. No sooner had Boniface so inspired the hearts of his priests and monks that the heroic martyrs were swallowed by the fury of the pagan mob. They rushed suddenly upon the holy men with swords and every kind of warlike weapon, staining their bodies with their precious blood. The death of St. Boniface, many years, many centuries later, to be called apostle to the Germans, was not a defeat. It was a victory for Christ. And the seed of the faith that Boniface had planted with his four decades of establishing monasteries, preaching, writing, and baptizing one of the Franks and Germans would be watered by his holy blood. He had chopped down the pagan oak and replaced it with the vine of Christ. The man who would attend the vine among the Franks and the Germans, building a great vineyard for the church, was at the moment of Boniface's martyrdom, not yet a man, but 12 years old, Charlemagne. Now, when we did this last time, we went forward and we talked about the life of Charlemagne. Now we're going to go back and talk about Boniface, but the point remains the same. There is no Charlemagne story without St. Boniface. So I'm giving away here at the beginning the one thing that we, we must take home. Like I say, every time we have a talk about history, yes, we can talk about some of the details and the events and things of this nature, and these complex relationships are going to come up. But what does it mean? What does it mean? There is no Charlemagne story without Boniface. I'll say more. Actually, better minds than I will say more. Catholic historian Christopher Dawson, in his book, The Making of Europe, describes St. Boniface this way. A man who had a deeper influence on the history of Europe than any Englishman who has ever lived. So this assertion is striking for several reasons. The most front and center to me in preparing this talk is we would think a man so influential would be better known. But I would venture to say that the average Catholic, and here I say, let's say, the average Sunday mass goer, uh, I'm, you know what, I'm going to go further. The average daily mass goer could not locate the century in which Boniface lived. Try it tomorrow when you go to mass. Stand outside afterwards. Ask people. Um, tell, you, tell me something about St. Boniface, right? So you might hear, oh, he was apostle to the Germans. Uh, you might hear he chopped down the big oak tree where the pagans worshipped Thor or Odin or Jupiter. Uh, a few might know that before he took the name or the Pope gave him the name Boniface, his name was Winfred. Uh, others might know that he was an Englishman, not a German. Uh, others might know he's brutally martyred. Some will probably tell you he invented the Christmas tree. And so we talked about Boniface's martyrdom. We explained, or, or I, I asserted, I don't think I've explained yet, that without, without Boniface, there's no Charlemagne. And in fact, um, Christopher Dawson uh, goes even further. He says, there, there's no, no Englishman who's had more influence on the history of Europe than Boniface. And yet here we know so little about him. Um, maybe we know that he invented the Christmas tree or something. So you, you all are going to do that experiment tomorrow morning and learn what you can about what people know about Boniface. So on the one hand, we have this sweeping assertion by an historian, a great historian. I mean, in terms of like meta historians or big picture historians, there's no better Catholic historian than the 20th century in my view. Um, and then we have this kind of general ignorance among Catholics that doesn't really seem to square with Boniface's influence. Uh, like, so if I said to you that Francis of Assisi was very influential, you you would agree with me, right? And you could tell me details of his life and the spiritual regeneration of church that he launched and, and the continued 
effects of his life today. And maybe you've read a biography of Francis of, of Assisi. But have you, have you read a biography of St. Boniface? I'm going to think you haven't. And the reason is there isn't one. Well, let me clarify. There is no modern authoritative biography of Boniface in English. There is a, a kind of a nice, charming one that was written in 1904 um, by a British uh, medical doctor, a man named James Williamson, um, by the way, whose patients included a very young Winston Churchill and a very old uh, Charles Marx. Uh, but he, he worked on, I mean, uh, Karl Marx, well, Charles, but Karl Marx, but he worked on the Isle of Wight, which was a kind of a, a resort seaside town. And so he had many famous patients. Um, there is an authoritative biography of Boniface from 1956 by a medievalist named Theodor Schieffer, Schieffer, but it's in German, right? And it's never been translated into English. So it's not just Dawson who turns to superlatives to talk about Boniface. Dawson's contemporary, a man named uh, Sir Frank Stenton, who ran the Royal Historical Society from 1937 to 1945, he says, the letters of St. Boniface are the most remarkable body of correspondence which has survived the Dark Ages. The most remarkable body, the most influential Englishman, and yet we really know very little bit, very little about this man. So let's see if this evening, uh, Ethernet, God willing, uh, let's see if we can provide some beginning of an answer uh, to this grave need, right? And we'll divide the conversation up this way. If you've if you've if you've endured one of my talks before, you know I like to I like to have a little bit of geography. Uh, so we're going to look at eighth century England, eighth century Germany. Uh, if you're like me. Italy, England, Spain, France, these are easy maps to get your imagination around. Germany, especially east of the Rhine, it's just a big, to me still today, it's a big confusion. So we'll look at the map, then we'll look at the political landscape of England and the continent. Uh, we'll show how the church is operating in this landscape. Uh, we'll do this in the course of a summary of, of, of the life of a man. And then we'll end with uh, what it means. And I've kind of given that part away a little bit. Uh, so my friends, Christopher Dawson and Frank Stanton have given us the short answer. So let's see if we can, uh, we can, we can flesh this out. Um, there's two primary source documents that you ought to be familiar with. One is the letters of St. Boniface. And letters probably should be called the correspondence of St. Boniface, because in these uh, 100 or so letters, um, are letters to him as well. Four popes he corresponds with, abbesses, uh, um, uh, 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 nobility. Uh, so uh, they really are very valuable just to get a sense of what uh, eighth and ninth century uh, Europe, Christian Europe looks like. Um, so uh, Ephraim Emerton is the most famous translation. And then there is a contemporary life that is written shortly after his death by someone who knew him, at least peripherally, a man named Willibald. Uh, and there's an excellent um, translation of it in this volume from uh, Penn State Press. It's called Soldiers of Christ. And I like this volume very much because it also includes like Martin Atour, St. Augustine, a lot of those early lives, which are super fun to read. So very good. All right, Boniface, born um, sometime between 672 and 680. Not exactly sure when. His name is Winfrith. Uh, let's try to locate this time in our imaginations. Uh, the Battle of Tours is half a century in the future. The coronation of Charlemagne is 120 years in the future. Uh, Gregory the Great sent St. Augustine of Canterbury 80 years in the past. Uh, England. Uh, uh, it's far from united at this stage in her history. What, what's the thing that kind of begins the uniting of England is Alfred's treaty, Alfred the Great's treaty with Guthrum, 
the Dane, that's in 880, right? So Boniface is two centuries before that. Uh, St. Patrick, uh, you know, almost three centuries before. He's around 400 AD. Um, but the character of England is a kind of a funny thing. It's, it's Celtic, it's Anglo-Saxon, but it's also still Roman. And we'll, 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 we'll talk about this as we, as we go through. But if we can look at the geography, Peter, that map of the Heptarchy, um, that's the one. So this is what historians many years later call the Heptarchy. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon Britain has come in. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons have sort of filled the vacuum at the end of uh, Roman rule. And there are these seven different kingdoms that uh, make up England. During the seventh and eighth centuries, Peter, the next one of England there, during the seventh and eighth century, the, this heptarchy is consult, uh, consolidated into East Anglia, Mercia, Kent, and Wessex. They're the big four, if you will. And Wessex, right, or West Saxon, right, is of chief interest to us. Wessex is where Alfred the Great will come from. And it's likely it's where Winfred was born. And in the 14th century, so many centuries after Boniface, the tradition was that he came from Crediton. If you look at uh, on that map there at the bottom, uh, you can just see there under Dumnonia there, there's a little sort of inlet kind of under the I and the A at the end of Dumnonia there. And uh, yeah, perfect, you got it, Peter. And that's, any, that's, that's where Exeter is. And then just kind of north of that uh, is where uh, Crediton is on the River Creedy, which flows into the River X. Uh, Winfred comes from a land-owning family. We know he has brothers. Uh, Willibald, his biographer, his hagiographer, really, I should say, tells us, because uh, hagiography, he's interested in the holiness of the man. And so um, we go to other sources to kind of fill in some of the facts like his correspondence. Uh, Willibald tells us as early as uh, four or five years old, he begins to think about the monastic life. Here's a quote. In his very early childhood, after he had been weaned and reared with a mother's usual anxious care, I love these, uh, his father lavished upon him more affection than upon the rest of his brothers. When he reached the age of about four or five, he conceived the desire to enter the service of God and began to think deeply of the advantages of monastic life. Okay, four or five years old. Well, very well. At the at even at this early age, he had subdued the flesh to the spirit and meditated on the things that are eternal rather than those are temporal. You know, sometimes we hear these stories and we say, "Come on!" But I mean, similar account in the uh, Raymond of Capua's uh, life of Saint Catherine. Right at a very young age, she's already applying the, the discipline uh, to, to herself. Um, this is another sort of common trope, if you will, in hagiography, and I don't mean that in a demeaning way. It just keeps coming up in these stories. Uh, Willibald tells us that his father resisted his son's piety and his devotion, uh, thinking, you know, you're going you're gonna to inherit the, the farm or the lands or whatever you're going to work. Uh, but his father fell ill, and then when he recovered, then he, he, you know, he 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 came around. Um, we we see this in again Saint Catherine of Siena. Francis de Sales is a good example of this of a father resisted his son. Uno Procera, uh, you know, he bids farewell to his parents without saying goodbye to them because they th he thinks they're going to resist. Um, uh, Samuel Mazzucchelli, not yet canonized, the apostle to Wisconsin, the man who builds. Uh, uh, um, all the churches starting from like Door County down to Dubuque, Iowa, Samuel Mazzo Kelly. He's, he's resisted by his, his father who wants him to become from a big uh, banking family. Um, so we, we see this kind of in the lives of saints. Uh, Winfred goes on to study as a boy, uh, first to, uh, and, and he goes on to the, the monasteries first in Exeter, so just south of him, and then uh, to Nursling which is near Winchester, so a little bit north, right? And what, why is Winchester important? It's the capital city of Wessex. 
So in addition to being the center of political authority, it's also it's also the center of religious authority or church church authority in the region. It's where the metropolitan is in Wessex, um, in Winchester. So he's ordained uh, somewhere around 702, 705, uh, and he demonstrates, so sometime maybe 25, 30 years old, he demonstrates extraordinary capacity for scholarship and learning. Also like Cunipro Serra, by the way. Uh, he writes a Latin grammar textbook. This is important, right? Latin is not Winfred's first language. Uh, he, um, uh, uh, but it is, of course, the, the language of the church. And there is this, um, there is still this Roman quality to England, which importantly, and we'll come to this, we're not going to find, especially when we get east of the Rhine, okay? Uh, as, uh, we, we, I'll say this several times. It's an important part of the Boniface story. When Augustine comes up into England, uh, Rome has been there. Uh, when Martin of Tours comes into France, Rome has been there. So there's already been a civilizing element that has come into uh, France, that has come into England, that we're not going to find, especially when we get east of the Rhine. And this is going to be important for, well, it's an important part of the story for, for, for several reasons, okay? Um, he also is uh, quite adept at poetry, and he writes a textbook on, uh, on meter. Right now we, uh, you know, meter. We all know what it is. Good. Um, he develops a great reputation as a preacher, and he also develops a great reputation as a man of excellent diplomatic skill. Today we would say he had great communication skills. Right. So here's a little story from Willibald that illustrates it, and I want to share it with you because, uh, well, it illustrates his skill as a, a, in diplomacy but also uh, it, it, it tells us another point important to informing our understanding of the story. When he had trained himself over long periods and the virtues already mentioned and given proof of his priesthood of many outstanding qualities, there arose a sudden crisis during the reign of Ine, king of the West Saxons. Ina, king of the West Saxons, occasioned by the outbreak of rebellion. On the advice of the king, the heads of the churches immediately summoned a council of the servants of God. If, if you remember from our talk on Gregory the Great long ago, when, when we see this word servants of God, especially in, the, in these uh, 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 early hagiographies, we're referring specifically to whom? The monastic class. Okay, the monastic class. Uh, and as soon as they were all assembled, a discussion satisfactory from every point of view took place among the priests. They adopted the prudent measure of sending trustworthy legates to Bertwald, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So we have a metropolitan in Canterbury. We have a metropolitan in Winchester. Fearing that if they had made any decision without the advice of the Archbishop, they would be accused of presumption and temerity. At the conclusion of the discussion, when they, when the entire gathering had reached an agreement, the king addressed all the servants of Christ, asking them who would they, who whom they would choose to deliver their message. Without hesitation, the senior abbot present, Winbert, who ruled over the monastery of Nursling, Winter, the abbot of Tisbury, Barrowall, the abbot of Glastonbury, and many others who professed the monastic life, summoned. Winfred and led him into the presence of the king. The king entrusted the message and the principal responsibilities of the embassy to him. And after giving him companions, sent him on his way. And he's immediately received by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And the conversation goes well. And the uh, and the, and and the quarrel and the unrest is quieted. But what's the other reason that I tell you this story apart to highlight an early example of the sort of the diplomatic skill and the communication skill that Boniface is going to have to use when he goes to the continent? Because it shows us that immediately bound up in the are, are the church 
and the lay nobility. These things are so 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 it's King Ine, Ina who's who's facing rebellion, but immediately the church comes into this conversation. So here's an example where the the secular nobility, the secular aristocracy, uh, are, uh, the secular royalty are reaching to the church to help resolve an issue. And as frequently, if not more frequently, we're going to find, especially when we get into France and into Germany, what we're going to find is the church is looking to the secular authority to help them uh, organize things and establish their authority. Okay, so this is a, this is a hard time for us to get our imaginations around because there's no analog in our experiences. We live with this sort of fiction of the separation of church and state. Uh, but you know, if you really want to begin to get get a hold of Christopher Dawson's medieval essays, and there's a great essay in there called Church and State, and it's a wonderful place to start. Um, so very good. All right. So so sometimes we have uh, sometimes it's a fraught relationship, sometimes harmonious, but whatever, it's an inextricable relationship. Now Boniface begins to get this idea that he wants to go on mission. Mission is not a word that would have been used in Boniface's age. I think the, the first time we see it in, in uh, Christian writing is sometime around the 17th century. But there is this notion of peregrinatio, uh, which comes from the Latin peregrinare, which means to travel abroad or to travel overseas and leave behind uh, the comforts of uh, where you are and, uh, and, and go into the unknown to spread the word of God. And so why does this idea enter Boniface's imagination? Well, there's the Celtic influence because the Irish monks from a generation and more beforehand, even a half century or century before, right? They did this. They went to the continent. Um, but uh, 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 Boniface, of course, had been very moved to bring the gospel to his people. And who are his people? Who are his ancestors? Where do they come from? Where do the Saxons come from? They come from the continent. They come from the area, that region that today we call Germany. Um, and then like Cunebrosera, he wants to take, especially, he's especially interested to take the, who never said it centuries later, he's especially interested to take the gospel to the unbaptized. This is, a, this, is a, this is on his heart, as we say nowadays, right? Um, and also like who never said it, Boniface or Winfred at the time still, could have led a perfectly fruitful life in the service of the church in Wessex. He was a first-rate scholar. He was an excellent Latinist. He was a fine theologian. He was an excellent preacher. He was a good organizer. There was certainly work for him to do. Same, same with Hinepro Sarah. Sarah was chair of the theology department at Majorca, one of the great schools of Europe at the time. But yet on his heart was to... I think of guys like Boniface. I think of guys like Sarah. I think of the Jesuits who come to North America First rate minds, you know, multiple languages, uh, serious polymaths, and 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 they and they and they kind of leave that world of scholarship behind, which is a worthy pursuit to go into among the savages, right? At great risk to themselves. Uh, and, and and even if not great risk to themselves, certainly to their material comfort. This, I think, is one of the principal inspirations that we're going to draw from this man. Uh, he travels to Phrygia, what we would call the Netherlands today, or Northwest Germany, kind of that region where both those are. At some point, Peter, if you want to throw up that map of the continent. Um, but it doesn't go well. Uh, it, you can see where Phrygia is kind of up there. Yeah, very good. Um, in 714, Winfred is about 40 years old. Pepin II dies. Uh, sometimes he's called Pepin of Herstal. Uh, he was the mayor of the palace in Austrasia. Can't go into the mayor of the palaces now. Listen to the lecture on Charlemagne to understand this sort of like chief of staff role that becomes the royalty of uh, France, uh, of the Holy Roman Empire, right? Of the Carolingians. 
um, Pepin, first of all, had, had established his authority there, Metz, Rennes, Trier, Cologne. Um, but, but, but he dies, and during, during this interregnum, before his son Charles Martel takes the helm, there's a rebellion by a pagan warlord, a man whose name is Radbod. And uh, he looks as this an opportunity to throw off the Merovingian rule. And Boniface decides this just isn't the time to uh, try to, um, to, 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 to evangelize. So, so he, he, he returns to nursling and uh, back, so back near Winchester, and he becomes the abbot. Uh, but he's been bitten by this missionary bug, if you will. And in 745, he's relieved of his office by the Bishop of Winchester, and he renews his plan to go to the Germans. This time, however, he takes a different uh, tack. Very important what he does. He gets letters of introduction uh, from the uh, 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 Bishop of Winchester, and he goes not to Germany, but where does he go? He goes to Rome. And uh, uh, by the way, never to return to his native land. Now, he's going to Rome on pilgrimage, of course, the practice of pilgrimage for the tombs of Peter and Paul it, by now is decades old. And those of you who've been to Rome, you know that it was especially popular among the Saxons because that neighborhood around St. Peter's is called the Borgo, right? And that church right down the street, uh, Santa Spirito in Sassia, right, in the neighborhood where the Saxons lived, in Sassia. So, so he, that area, that's not where the Holy See is. The Holy See is over at the Lateran, across the river at this time. Um, but this is where the bones of Peter are. And so he goes there, and he um, he, he he finally impresses upon Pope Gregory II of his merits, and uh, Gregory meets with him, and then he gives him, a, he, he writes him a letter, uh, and it's in his correspondence, and and it is at this moment that he's, he, he gives him the name Boniface. Gregory, servant of the servants of God to the devout priest Boniface. And why does he name him Boniface? Because it's on May 15th, and the day before, May 14th, and it's still, those of you who um, uh, worship God according to the 1962 Missal, if you look in your 1962 Missal, May 14th, it's Boniface the Martyr. So Boniface is named by Boniface the Martyr, and uh, or, or after Boniface the Martyr, by Gregory II. And Gregory meets with him. There's a month, they have months in Rome. Uh, Boniface meets with him in, in his, uh, in, in his um, correspondence, he says, uh, or, in, or in Willibald's biography, he says, uh, daily. So this is a kind of an unusual thing. The Pope, who's living at the Lateran, is coming across the river to see Boniface, or Boniface is going to the Lateran to see him. We're not exactly sure. But they meet more than once over a period of months. They meet frequently. Uh, and uh, Boniface uh, heads north after their series of meetings to, uh, as Willibald puts it, the wild tribes of Germania. And if we can throw that map back up again, he goes first to Thuringia, which is kind of right in the middle of uh, where, right in the middle of, of uh, right in kind of sort of central Germany. And he starts to win over the tribal chieftains. Now, the confused situation in Thuringia, this may be why Gregory II uh, spent so much time with him that he had in mind. This is where he wanted him to go and met with him uh, So uh, over so many days. In his words, he described the region, the Pope described the region, persistent paganism and the precarious position of the church. So... He doesn't have the authority of a bishop, and he presses north to Phrygia, where he had not met with success years before, but now Radbod was dead, uh, and his missionary efforts bear fruit. He's baptizing, 
uh, and preaching the gospel. And then he goes on to Hesia, which is where Frankfurt is today. Those of you who are familiar with the map, we can throw it back up there. And here he is coordinating, and then we get back into this involved relationship between church and state. He begins to coordinate with Charles Martel the expansion of Frankish rule east of the Rhine. And he reports back to Rome on his successes. He ends up going back to Rome. And there he has to give a profession of faith to the Pope. And he tries to recite it. But remember, Latin is not his first language. So he has to write it out. He writes it out and he reads it to the, to the Pope. He makes a profession of faith. And then he's ordained a bishop. He goes back to Hesia with priests in tow. And now that he's a bishop, he can, of course, ordain more priests. So what does his work look like here? Now he's back in Thuringia and Hesia. Phrygia is working east of the Rhine. He's preaching. He's baptizing. But he's also exhorting wayward priests. He's not the first Christian to come into east of the Rhine. The Celts had been down there before. But remember, like I said, my friends, this is pagan territory. The Romans had not been there. So the gospel hadn't really taken hold. So you have priests who are, you know, still maybe in some cases practicing, well, certainly it's in his correspondence, practicing pagan rituals as well. Bishops who are not leading, leading upstanding lives, nobility as well. And he's exhorting with them. He's giving catechism classes. Um, he, he, he runs into a quarrel with the bishop, uh, but at, but once he once he has once he is a bishop, now he has the authority not only to create priests, but do what very important to the mission, establish monasteries, establish monasteries. Now today, when we think of a monastery, we think of something like Clear Creek, right? Or um, uh, my friends there at uh, up, up in Gower at Ephesus, the Benedictine Mary of Apostles, sort of removed from the world. But in this period, uh, what are monasteries? <clears throat> They're the, they are the centers <clears throat> of cultural life, right? <clears throat> They're the centers of cultural life. So let's think about this. I, I said to you that when, when Martin of Tours and Augustine come up into France and England, respectively. They're, they're, they're going over ground that the Romans had been over, right? Or when the Christians start to evangelize Italy or other parts of the Roman Empire, they're going over ground that Romans had been over. And what was, what was the central element to the Roman Empire? Cities. Cities. So cities were an important place is where you could establish uh, yourself and begin to teach and 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 spread spread the word of God and have liturgy and 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 catechesis and all the things sacraments all the things necessary and works of mercy, um, but there there really aren't any cities in the sense that you and I think of them, east of the Rhine because these are sort of nomadic pagan tribes, right? Uh, I mean maybe little towns and things of this nature, villages, right? But not like cities. So the monastery, very important, my friends begins to uh, take the role that a city would have taken in um, in, in, in something that where the Romans had 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 already been. All right. 725, we have the, one of the defining moments of his career, uh, probably in Hesia. We don't know exactly the spot in the interest of time. I won't read you Willibald's account of it, but you already know it. He's clearly doing this as a demonstration. It has been set up. He's invited all of these pagan uh, 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 princes and pagan priests to witness what he's about to do. And he chops down this sacred tree to Odin or Thor or Jupiter, to whomever it is. Now, in, the, in Willibald's account, he strikes it once and it falls into four pieces. Very important, which fun, I'm happy to believe. Very important, he takes the lumber from the tree, and what does he do? He builds a temple to St. Peter the Apostle. Why is this important, my friends? Because also central to the Boniface story is that we are trying to, he is trying to establish this tie between the church, east of the Rhine especially, but also eventually the Frankish church, with 
the Holy See. You are connected to Peter, right? And, and we think, well, of course, of course. Well, it's not obvious. It isn't obvious to the people uh, east of the Rhine that their authority, that Boniface's authority comes from Rome. Um, Boniface correspondence gives a very good sense of, uh, the, uh, of the minutia with which he deals. Uh, he has questions to Rome concerning the validity of baptisms, Catholic priests performing pagan animal sacrifice on Christian altars, uh, adulterous priests. What comes, something that comes up a lot in his letters is degrees of marriage, consanguinity. He's constantly asking questions about degrees of marriage. Um, liturgical rites, uh, the, the, the receipt of uh, the Eucharist by lepers. The Pope says, yes, you can give uh, the Eucharist to lepers. There is a controversial one that some of you may have heard about um, in, 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 in one of his letters uh, with Gregory II. Um, and it has to do with a woman, a wife, who cannot render the conjugal debt because of illness. And um, well, what we don't have is Boniface's question. What we do have is Gregory's response. And it's a little ambiguous, but it, it, it might come up in a conversation you have, because some Protestants like to use this uh, to say that the Holy See supported divorce. Um, Gregory writes to him, you ask first within what degrees of relationship marriage may take place. Uh, okay, blah, blah, blah. We talked about that. As to your question, what a man, I'm sorry, I said blah, blah, blah about something the Pope wrote. It, it's important. Um, so as to your question, what a man is to do, his wife is unable on account of disease to fulfill her wifely duty. It would be well if he could remain in a state of continence. But since this is a matter of great difficulty, it is better for him who cannot refrain to take a wife. So Pope's quoting St. Paul here, sort of, sounds like, right? Uh, he may not, however, withdraw his support from the one who was prevented by disease, provided she not be involved in any grievous fault. So that's all we know from this account of it, except that, and there's been a, an excellent, there was, a, there was a, a book written in the 70s by uh, a, uh, a Jesuit uh, scholar named William Kelly. And, um, and, he, and, he take, and he spends 300 pages on this broad question. Um, and he writes, you know, only if a tradition strongly fit, that strongly favored divorce and remarriage would it be reason in, in Gregory's age, would it be reasonable to suppose that Gregory had permitted divorce and remarriage? But in fact, the church had well established uh, 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 that, that uh, um, you know, that, that uh, it's, how can we put it, sort of an anti divorce um, uh, attitude, teaching, doctrine. Um, so now there has to be another way to explain this, and we don't have uh, Boniface's question. And what we can most likely assume here is that, um, uh, that, that this is an illness that took place sometime between the marriage and before uh, the marriage was consummated. But uh, even if there is this possibility, remote as it is, that Gregory permitted divorce and remarriage, uh, the likelihood is remote, and and since this is the only text we have, uh, it, it's going to remain an ambiguous text, and it doesn't really inform the church's historical conversation on divorce and remarriage. It's just kind of one of those gee whiz moments in the in the in the in the history of of Boniface. Of, of Boniface. Uh, he's a very effective preacher. He describes the importance of preaching in uh, his letters, and He's a very effective organizer, all right? Uh, he's operating in Hesha and Thuringia, uh, and the pressing problem for him in this time is how the church in Germany is going to be organized. And we get a, and we get a, a glimpse of this in uh, a letter uh, from Gregory in 724, Gregory II, uh, concerning a wayward bishop and a dispute about jurisdiction. Um, but this is the money quote. As for that bishop, who up to the present time has failed through a certain slothfulness to spread through the same region the word of preaching, but now claims for himself 
a part therein as belonging within his jurisdiction. We have written a fatherly letter to our most excellent son, Charles the Patrician. So who's he talking about? Charles Martel. So, so when there's a question of a wayward bishop here, the Pope is writing to Boniface, but to whom else is he writing? He's writing to the secular authority. So again, we see these two authorities, secular and religious, bound up, urging him to keep the former in check, and we believe that he will give us, he will give orders to prevent this wrong. So my friends, again, it's kind of a hard thing to get our imaginations around, but Boniface and Charles Martel, uh, I, I, I can't even say each in his own sphere of authority because these spheres of authority are heavily, or these circles heavily overlapping in the Venn diagram in this confused state where we are in, in a period of transition from uh, pagan villages into something like civilized Germany. And like I say, it's not going to be until Charlemagne uh, that we really start to reap this harvest. Okay, mindful of time. Let's go a little bit uh, quick. Boniface brings to this question of organization uh, the organization he knew that when he was in England, and we talked about this at the beginning, right, with metropolitans and suffragan bishops, and which was really Roman in its origin. Why? Because it came from Gregory the Great. It is Gregory, it is so so it is Gregory the Second's. Uh, there are four popes in the life of Boniface, Gregory the Second, uh, Gregory the Fourth, Zachary, and Stephen. Um, it's Gregory the Sec, it's Gregory the Third who sets this in motion. How does he do it? He makes Boniface an archbishop. He sends in the pallium. He doesn't really have a C, right? Uh, the, the, the ecclesial organization in Germany, east of the Rhine, like I've been saying, it's not sophisticated like it is in Rome. Uh, and so uh, there, there, it, it, progress is very, very slow here. But now that he does have uh, the pallium, now he can go about the work of uh, um, making suffragan bishops and setting up dioceses, okay? Slowly Boniface organizes, and this is how he does it. Monasteries, as I've already mentioned, ordaining bishops. And the third thing, and we're coming close to the end. Thank you for your patience. The third thing, and I know this is a fraught word now, uh, holding synods. He holds synods, right? So gatherings of ecclesial and, by the way, at the same time and place, secular authority, all right? Now, look, the details of this work go beyond the scope of this talk and, frankly, beyond my, by my command of it. Um, but there's a key moment in the story that you should know. Charles Martel dies, and his sons, Carloman and Pippin, uh, and, and a third son, Griffo, uh, have a brief struggle for power. Um, Boniface weighs in or, 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 or hooks his wagon to Griffo, uh, who's quickly out of the fight. So now he knows his future is with the two sons of Charles Martel, Pepin and Carloman. Okay. Um, and uh, 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 Carloman, who is the more pious, the more devout, the more religious of the two uh, backs Boniface in calling what now in church history we call the Concilium Germanicum of 742, a big German council, right? And the precepts from this council are promulgated as a capitulary. Go listen to the Charlemagne talk for a lengthy explanation of what a capitulary is. But, it, but it's a secular order, uh, but of, in this case, of uh, church canons, church practices, church disciplines, but distributed by the secular authority. Reinforced canon law, 
Physicians Boniface is metropolitan. Priests are to subject their contact to the scrutiny of bishops. Uh, heathen customs are abolished. Church property that had been taken by uh, unscrupulous noblemen and aristocrats must be returned to the church. This process takes a while. Um, there is a subsequent synod in 745 uh, attended by both Carloman and Pippin. Um, but shortly thereafter, Carloman, I mentioned to you, he's the more devout of the two. Anybody know what he does? He goes to pursue religious life. Um, and so Pepin becomes the sole heir, right? Why were there two heirs? There was no primogeniture in France at this time. So the kingdom had been divided. But now Carloman enters a monastery. And now Pepin is the, effectively, he is the ruler of the Franks. And this is the support in the form of the anointing that Boniface exactly how willingly he does it. This is a, something we can debate, but nonetheless, he does it. And he's it, it, anointing Pepin and setting in motion that it, it's now this family of the mayors of the palace who are the new royalty of the Franks, right? And then of course, it's gonna be Pepin's son, Charlemagne, who, um, uh, like I say, brings in this harvest. Okay, uh, very good. I think that this is a this is this is uh, 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 we're, we're nearing the end of his life. Um, Boniface does not enjoy with Pepin the same uh, relationship that he did with Carloman. Uh, Pepin is a loyal son of the church, but his own interests also inform his decisions. Boniface is getting old and tired, to be sure, and he decides that he simply does want to end uh, his life doing what he did for the Germans in the very beginning. And so he goes back into Phrygia to preach the gospel, and his life ends with his martyrdom with which we began. Let's give, what does it mean? Let's give the word, final word to uh, Benedict the Sixteenth, who summarizes it certainly better than I can. Centuries later, what message can we gather today from the teaching and marvelous activity of this great missionary and martyr? For those who approach Boniface, an initial fact stands out. The centrality of the word of God lived and interpreted in the faith of the church, a word that he lived, preached, and witnessed to until he gave the supreme gift of himself in martyrdom. He was so passionate about the word of God that he felt the urgent need and duty to communicate it to others, even at his own personal risk. This word was the pillar of the faith, which he had committed himself to spreading at the moment of his Episcopal ordination. In one of his letters, he writes, I profess integrally the purity of the holy Catholic faith, and with the help of God, I desire to remain in the unity of this faith, in which there is no doubt that the salvation of Christians lie. The second most important proof that emerges from the life of Boniface is his faithful communion with the Apostolic See, which was a firm and central reference point of his missionary work. He always preserved this communion as a rule of his mission and left it as it were as his will. In a letter to Pope Zachary, he said, I never cease to invite and to submit to obedience to the apostolic see those who desire to remain in the Catholic faith and in the unity of the Roman church and all those whom God grants to me as listeners and disciples in my mission. One result of this commitment was the steadfast spirit of cohesion among the successor of Peter, which Boniface transmitted to the church in his mission territory, uniting England, Germany and France with Rome, and thereby effectively contributing to planting these those Christian roots of Europe, which were to produce abundant fruit in the centuries to come. Boniface also deserves our attention for a third characteristic. He encouraged the encounter between the Christian Roman culture 
and the Germanic culture. Indeed, he knew that humanizing and evangelizing culture was an integral part of his mission as bishop. In passing on the ancient patrimony of Christian values, he grafted onto the German populations a new, more human lifestyle, thanks to which the inalienable rights of the person were more widely respected. As a true son of St. Benedict, he was able to combine prayer and labor, manual intellectual, pen and plow. His ardent zeal for the gospel never fails to impress me. At the age of 41, he left a beautiful and fruitful monastic life, the life of a monk and teacher in order to proclaim the gospel to the simple, to the barbarians. Once again, at the age of 80, he went to a region where he foresaw his martyrdom. By comparing his ardent faith, this zeal for the gospel with our own after lukewarm and bureaucratized faith, we see what we must do and how to renew our faith in order to give the precious pearl of the gospel as a gift to our time. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we've got time for a couple of questions. If you can stick around. Uh, Happy to, though. I really told be... you everything I know. Mm -hmm. Doctor, can we start with this one uh, from Joan, just asking if St. Boniface, is he a patron saint of Germany? Yes. Um, and is there anything, or, or what would today's bishops of Germany, uh, what what should they learn from him? Do they hold him in high esteem? I, I, think, I think they should learn that they shouldn't do the chicken dance in the sanctuary of their churches. Uh, they, 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 they should hold him in high esteem. I, I don't know that they know any more about Boniface than, um, than you know, the average American Catholic does. He's buried in Fulda, by the way. So if you go to Germany, you want to go and uh, uh, visit him there at his tomb and ask him to intercede for the Germans. Uh, but you don't need to go all the way to Fulda to do that. You can just do it right here. Um, uh, to pray for him. His feast is the date of his martyrdom, which is June 5th, I think. Um, yeah, you know, uh, it, uh, it, it, he, he, he was loyal to the word of God. He was loyal to the Holy Father. He was loyal to the rule of St. Benedict. I didn't even, I didn't, in, 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 the, in the capitulary that followed that first, that, ma that major Germanic syn synod, the rule of St. Benedict was established as the rule that the monasteries in Germany would follow. And of course, there's a great flowering of Christianity, uh, um, yeah, for centuries, for centuries and centuries. And uh, now it's in the throes of another, of another Protestant rebellion from some people with inside the church. Um, you know, I, we, we can speculate about what Boniface would think. I think he'd be a little blue about it. Here's the thing. I'd like to think about how difficult it is to be a faithful German Catholic right now. I mean, those are people who really need our prayers. They're, 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 how far are they having to travel to find a reverent mass or to get their, you know, sins absolved, for example? Um, that's got to be very difficult. I kind of think in some ways increasingly like if you wanted to but for different reasons uh if you know if you if you if you wanted good sacraments in mexico in the 30s or something like that so maybe we're not quite there in germany but uh imagine being a faithful catholic in germany right now that's gonna be pretty tough that's a great point yeah something to pray for for sure somebody to pray i mean for. Uh, yeah. uh whatever looniness we experience here in the united states and there is no shortage of it um almost all of us if we're willing to uh uh spend a little gas uh, can can get to a good reverent liturgy. Right. Uh, uh, next question here for you. Uh, you mentioned the Christmas tree connection kind of in passing at the beginning. Do you put, um, how much stock do you put in that? Is is that where we get the Christmas tree, his chopping of the, the oak? Um, so uh, the story goes that 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 he, he after he chopped up the the donar oak that he then set little candles on the remains of the tree and then invited the uh, or, or began to to preach the word of god and that the tradition of the lighted tree comes out of this um it may be a pious 
legend. Uh, I, I, I think that it is um, Father Hezekiah is going to scold me here, but nonetheless, I think it's sent. I, I think it's several centuries later before we really see. In, first of all, I think the Christmas tree does come from Germany. I, I certainly think that's true. Uh, but I think it's several centuries later before we see a regular practice of this and exactly where it comes from. I can't say, but I'm happy to give all the credit to St. Boniface because if he's not the if he's not the 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 physical father of the Christmas tree, he's certainly a spiritual father of the Christmas tree. Hey Ben, I like that. That's great. That's great. Okay, uh, did St. Boniface encounter much violent resistance among the people he was evangelizing, and how, how was he martyred in the end? Oh, well, so, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, he, 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 he is martyred violently, but he's, he's in Phrygia, he is uh, awaiting the arrival of some... Um, neophytes baptized but not yet confirmed christians and he uh, and, and they're supposed to be meeting him to receive from the bishop the or in this case archbishop the sacrament of baptism and it, he is fell upon by uh, a gang of highwaymen robbers um it's not entirely clear. The church recognizes him as a martyr because he is he 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 is spreading the gospel in Phrygia. Uh, but it may be that the men, the band of robbers that that slayed him and his companions uh, with axes and swords, probably or clubs, um, may simply have been interested in in in, in robbing them. Um, even from uh, Willibald's account, that's not clear. But given that he was in the mission field and died there in the service of Christ, the church recognizes him as a martyr. Um, uh, but throughout, uh, uh, other than this, throughout his life, I mean, early in his, uh, or, or when, he, when he makes his first mission to the continent, uh, there is going to, there, 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 there is some um, political violence between Radbod and uh, uh, the, the Merovingians. Um, Boniface just recognizes this is not a this is not a um, this is not a fruitful time to try to be spreading the word of God. Things need to calm down. But there, I I think I've read most of the letters, and I don't see an account here where he's expressing fear for his life. Uh, just beyond the ordinary, it, not not so much not not in the ways to say the Jesuit martyrs in North America would have, or um, you know, uh, other missionaries in other part of the world who who really were going in, into worlds uh, worlds of areas of violence. Sure, yeah, sure, got it. Yeah, uh, okay. This next one, this this is a fun question from Charles because uh, today it makes me think. You know, you can just hand somebody a catechism of the Catholic Church and they've got it all right there, but. Charles asks, what type of documents and references did people like Boniface use to teach in, in their missionary work? Yeah, that is a great question. And in fact, uh, we get some clues about that in, um, in, 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 in his letters. He's, he's asking frequently, especially writing back to England, to uh, uh, abbots and bishops in England, for religious texts, chiefly the scriptures, and there's one element. There's there's one case that's very striking. Um, he writes to and he has he has he has a correspondence with with several abbesses, uh, and there's one where he asks an abbess to prepare for him the uh, epistles of Peter, uh, and to do it in gold so her nuns are going to be the ones who do the calligraphy here and do do the um illumination and so he's asking for uh peter in gold ink and he wants this um especially to well to 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 make a dramatic point if you will he's He's much like he did with the Donar Oak. 
he's trying he, he said well this is this is this is the word of the apostle peter here and look by the way here it is written in gold so uh yeah but from his um correspondence we find he's frequently asking for documents uh for clarifications and points of canon law uh and and for uh copies of the scripture especially great question i encourage i think these letters are tons of fun they're super easy to read they're not complicated and there's a there's a retired professor from um Notre Dame, uh, whose name is Thomas F.X. Noble. Uh, I think F.X. must stand for Francis Xavier. I, I haven't asked him. Um, but I was fortunate to find him. He's retired now, but we struck up a correspondence when I was preparing this lecture. And if you read his introduction in the letters, uh, Thomas Noble's, uh, it will really get, I mean, I, I, I stole very heavily from it in preparing this talk. I should have said that at the beginning. But if you read that, it will set you up really, really well to read these letters. And like uh, Dr. Frank Stenton said, you're not going to get a better window or more comprehensive window into, uh, um, you know, uh, eighth and ninth century. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, lots of fun. That's great. Maybe maybe to expand on that, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Um, just given the full title and then maybe any other resources for further study on this topic. And and actually, I'll add to that Dawson, where where to start with Christopher Dawson. Yeah, sure. Okay, so Letters of St. Boniface, but like I say, a better title would be the, the Correspondence of St. Boniface because, you know, there, there are letters to him in here as, as, as well from abbesses, from popes, uh, from four different popes, in fact. And, and by the way, we have a very, very high confidence in the authenticity of all these letters because his successor, a man named Lull, Archbishop Lull, immediately gathers them up and preserves them, and Willibald makes use of them in his preparation. So they've been preserved for and copied for a very long time. The other one is the actual, uh, there are four lives or five lives of St. Boniface. Some are a uh, century or so later, but the contemporary one is by Willibald, and you can find it online, but I like it in this volume here from Penn State Press, Soldiers of Christ, Saints and Saints' Lives from Late Antiquity and the Early Middle Ages, and also edited by Thomas F.X. Noble uh, and Thomas Head. These are lots of fun. Um, okay, yeah, so for general understanding, uh, of the of the period and god bless catholic university and those guys at catholic studies um at, at the university of saint thomas for bringing out a lot of dawson um the making of europe uh i i, I highly recommend in the chapter in there especially that you're interested in well you'll find it but it's the western church and the conversion of the barbarians so that's the chapter in the making of Europe that you want. And then uh, um, the religion and culture also by Dawson. But then this one, hang on, uh, medieval essays by Dawson. This is great. And there's that one that I recommended, that chapter that I recommended in there to you. Uh, uh, I mean, if you want to understand the medieval mind, this is just a great book. But Church and State, also on Church and State, you guys should get this guy. If you know, if you have you had Andrew Willard Jones do a talk? Oh no, book? but I've uh, he's on my short list. Oh yeah, my gosh, this great. It, this book here, my friends. Now this is a little bit later, of course, before Church and State, uh, a study of social order and the sacramental kingdom of Louis the Ninth. This guy, Andrew Willard Jones, he writes for New Polity. He's part of that crowd. He teaches at Franciscan. I don't know anybody alive right now who's just got a better grasp of, of the way the medievals understood the world. Uh, so I highly recommend all of uh, Willard Jones. And then, hang on a sec. This is great. We get, we get a glimpse into your whole library here. <laughs> oh, wait a oh, I already showed you this one. I have two copies of it. Making of Europe. Yeah, this is a crummy 
super paperback version. I'm ready in books. But anyway, yeah, so those are the people I stole from in the preparation of this talk. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And and I am inspired by how you began your presentation by situating us in history. You know, you said, imagine put, imagine where we are in history, right? And and you want, this is where all of you want to be, is to be able to go through that exercise and with a couple of reminders and boom, you are, you, you, Charlemagne's coming up, St. Patrick a couple of centuries before, you've placed yourself, you know the story, you know where we are. Because this is, it's our story. It's, it's, these are our ancestors in the faith. These are our family, our family stories that have been passed down. And you're learning something about yourself when you learn I'll, about the church. I'll history. tell you who really, I mean, it's kind of a sense that I've had for a long time, but the guy that really brought this into relief for me was, you know, decades ago, the great Brendan McGuire, who used to, yeah. you know, lecture, God rest his soul, for Institute for Catholic Culture. And he says, every age commits the offense of viewing uh, events in history through the dominant paradigms of their own age. And um, you got to let them go. You, you just, and, and it's difficult to do. Sometimes, I mean, you can't, nobody can do it entirely, but you, you just got to give a whirl to do it. And, and, and to me, getting inside the medieval mind is a tough one. But when I do, I think, boy, I was born in the wrong century. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Thank you for sharing all this with us tonight. We'll uh, we'll we'll let you go. We'll wrap up here. Um, would you mind closing us out in uh, with a prayer this sure. evening? Sure. Well, let's commend uh, uh, the the church in Germany and the church throughout the world uh, through the intercession of Saint Boniface and also uh, through Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. As we pray, remember, O Most Gracious Virgin Mary that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided, inspired by this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin, Virgin of Mother, to thee do we come before thee, we stand so from sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer us. Amen. St. Boniface. Pray for us. Glory to God. Amen.